¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo están? Bienvenidos a otra entrevista en exploración espacial. Y esta la, la quise dedicar a la ciencia en la misión Artemis 2. No te olvides que acá en exploración espacial te vamos a contar todas las últimas las últimos novedades con respecto a esta misión. Y se acuerdan, la, la semana pasada tuvimos un montón de noticias llegando de Houston con diferentes conferencias de prensa confirmando que la misión seguramente la va a lanzar en febrero, eh, potencial febrero, abril, pero más chances en febrero. Uno de esos paneles, estas conferencias de prensa que tuvimos, aparte de los astronautas también hablando, fue uno dedicado a la ciencia y tecnología eh, que, va a ver, que vamos a tener en Artemis 2. Y después de ese panel tuve chance de hablar con Lisa Carnell. Eh, Lisa trabaja en el directorio de ciencias de la NASA, pero además ella es la directora de ciencias físicas y biológicas. Eh, está, está basada en Washington y nos cuenta, es prácticamente responsable de gran parte de las actividades científicas que vamos a ver en la misión Artemis 2 y sobre todo este experimento, este proyecto se llama Avatar, fascinante, cómo cada astronauta va a llevar este Avatar justamente como si fuera un mini-me de cada uno de ellos y, y en este Avatar se pueden simular órganos humanos para ver cómo responden a la par de los astronautas en, durante el viaje, increíble a lo que hemos llegado. Fíjense, ella nos va a explicar con mucho más detalle en la entrevista. Eh, espero que lo disfruten. Vamos a tener muchas más novedades con respecto a Artemis 2. Ya estoy preparando más videos, tengo más entrevistas. No te olvides de suscribirte si recién llegás. Podés hacerte miembro del canal también y activar la campanita para que te avise. Y si tenés preguntas sobre la parte científica, ponémelas en los comentarios. Nos vemos en la próxima. Lisa, what a pleasure. Thank you so much. It's a, a very nice to meet you. And uh, why don't you tell us exactly what you do. I know you are uh, more on the science division, uh, medical sciences. So uh, what is your role in the Artemis II mission? Yeah, so I am the director of the biological and physical sciences division under the science mission directorate. And for Artemis II, my division is, has um, put together a project called Avatar. And this is in partnership with, you know, other organizations within NASA, other government agencies in the United States, and small businesses. So it's this, you know, real public-private partnership that we have. And the project is called AVATAR, that stands for a Virtual Astronaut Tissue Analog Response. And, you know, we love our acronyms at NASA, but I love AVATAR because it's truly what it is. Um, and what's really exciting is literally we have, I've, I've got a little demo here for you if you can see oh, that let me see yeah i can i don't know if you can see that very well there there you go oh, wow oh, yes yeah so it's really tiny i think you might have seen um you know mark clamp and talk yes. about it this morning it's literally the size of like a small usb drive and we are making one of these from each of the astronauts that are flying on board artemis 2 and we're going to be able to make measurements in this human biology and compare it directly to them. So this is a really incredible science, um, uh, health, revolutionizing health, you know, for NASA, for on Earth. So, you know, there's so much that I have to say about this. It's incredibly exciting. Uh, Lisa, how do they, how the astronauts are going to use this? This is, this is the skin chip that they were mentioning? So this is, um, this is a bone marrow model okay. that we'll be sending. And so we basically draw blood from the astronauts ahead of time and we separate out the bone progenitor cells from that. And within that, we create you, we inject the cells into this plastic model that I showed you. And with coupled with some other factors, we basically recreate the entire bone marrow structure inside of this chip. And then we perfuse it so similar to as if you had blood running through and we'll be able to have it run right alongside them. And what's really great about the bone marrow model, first, it's very sensitive to radiation, which is one of the components that we're looking at in the deep space environment. But also, uh, that's this is right where the immune system starts, you know, with the red and white blood cells. So being able to look at the immune system function, you know, at the core where it begins is really going to be incredible. And comparing that with our sister organization, the Human Research Program, and the output that they're getting. Uh, Lisa, I see the, during the, the, the conference call, they mentioned several activities regarding health. Yeah. Uh, so they're doing this flywheel exercise. I'm yep. going to ask you about that. They're going to collect saliva 
from uh, the crew. They're going to do those chips that you mentioned to me. What, are, what is it that you're expecting the most? What is, what is it that NASA needs to achieve or understand from this mission? So this mission is just so all-encompassing. I would say the, the number one goal of this mission is really to understand and check out um, the, the vehicle itself and how crew respond and can actually live and function inside of Orion, the capsule. Uh, you probably heard them talk about not just the flywheel, but like the galley and having you know the restroom facilities and, and living and functioning inside of this small um, container and compartment. On top of that, you know, what I think is incredible is that, you know, NASA is taking advantage of this opportunity so that we can do this incredible science that we've never been able to do before. We've never had the opportunity to really evaluate and apply the lessons learned from the International Space Station. So understanding bone loss and muscle loss, you know, really applying like the exercise aspect. Well, what I thought was really interesting too, we're going to have the crew exercise to ensure how does this work in this environment? But also, you know, the, it, there's dual fold because the ECLA system has to be able to scrub all that excess CO2. So we're testing out all the systems and features. Right, right. And even like, can you can you exercise? And you know, does it get too too confined? Um, we're studying the immune system, like the the saliva blots that you had talked about. You know, do we see viral re reactivation even in the short duration mission? But does the deep space radiation environment accelerate any of this? We see immune function changes very early on in space station. And so we definitely think we'll see immune function, whether that's an adaptation to the space flight environment no. or acclimation or just an alteration that we need to take into account. Um, so, so, so many of those things. And then coupled with Avatar, where we can actually you know, measure what's happening in the bone marrow when they return. Uh, Lisa, what is the, this flywheel? I, I'm trying to imagine it on my on my head, but it's like, I know it's near the hatch when they are, um, uh, but what is it exactly, how, how does it work? So the flywheel actually isn't in my area. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <laughs> but you need, to explain, you need to explain it anyway. <laughs> But it's in the human research programs purview, but you know, as they were describing, it's it's like um, it's almost like a rowing machine. They had to get something very small that yeah. and portable, and so you know, they look at ways that they can do strength training and then cardiovascular, like kind of keep them moving for the muscles. But the strength training is really you know, significant and important to mitigate the the bone, not, not just the bone loss, but more so for the muscle loss, right? The, there's there's another comment that they made during the call that there's is uh, maybe under, uh, I didn't understand. Is there a section of the capsule that is uh, going to protect them, or they used to be using or a device or a blanket to protect against radiation? Yeah. So um, Orion was designed so that you know in the event of a solar a, a significant solar particle event um, where they need to shelter in place that they can actually go down. There's there's a hatch where they have some different lockers stored. They can go down inside there and being surrounded by additional materials and the location of it will provide the most protection for the crew from a solar particle event and, wow. and excess radiation. Lisa, uh, final question. Um, we've been in lower orbit like 25 years. Right. We. I think we have a, a pretty good understanding on how the human body uh, can live on space on uh, between six months, one year. Yep. Now we are we are going to the moon. The idea is to stay, then to Mars. A philosophical, metaphysical question. Do you think we are ready? Do you think the human body, with the knowledge we have, that we have accumulated during 25 years, are we ready to the challenge of uh, going to Mars, for example, right now? If you were to ask me if we're ready to send a human to Mars today, I would say no. <laughs> there is we we have learned a lot and we will use all of that knowledge from low Earth orbit. But what we don't know is what the effect once we get out into deep space, 
what that's going to do to the human body because the deep space radiation, you know, as you're probably well aware, and I know you asked some radiation questions, so definitely something that you're interested in is, is that it, it's very hard to shield from and mitigate against. And so especially the galactic cosmic radiation and it's penetrating the spacecraft. And um, so how we, how we venture into deep space, we still have a lot that we need to learn. Now, so if you were to break that into multiple parts, we've got, let's say, whether it's lunar surface or Mars, a transit to Mars is say roughly six months. Yeah, That is gonna be in a microgravity environment, similar to what we've seen on station. There are things that we don't know though, coupled with like the radiation environment. And then also I think some really important aspects that are, that you know, we may not be able to do much to find out. We are doing ground-based analogs to try to un uncover the best team dynamics. If you're going to, you know, you and three or four of your buddies are going for this long duration trip, how do you stay mentally healthy? And then, so you've got that to contend with. But then once you land on the, on the surface, whether it's Mars or the lunar surface for a long period of time, well, you have this different environment, right? You've got different atmosphere, you've got partial gravity. So, you know, I think it was interesting, you know, and Jake Bleacher mentioned it. When our astronauts return home from a really long mission on the space station, they, they tend to have trouble like walking and getting up. They have a lot of PT, they get a lot of assistance. But if they land on Mars after six months, Who's exactly. going to be there to help them? How are we going to take care of that element of it? And so there's a lot that we still don't know. Um, and, you know, these are these are some of the questions that we're trying to answer when we do these measurements on Artemis II in the very early stages and how we build off that information that we're learning to help advance our knowledge. So you would say that the, the main obstacle right now would be how to deal with radiation, uh, the psychology up the as aspects of a mission in terms of team team building mm -hmm. on team relationships yeah um and then the physical aspects of the human body too if, if he can withstand or it can withstand uh, uh arriving to mars and then dealing with uh, uh working every day on the surface of another planet right absolutely uh how how far away are we from uh Having that risk because we we are trying to, we are I mean Artemis two three four I mean the idea of going to the moon is like few years away uh, then Mars Mars is a a, a, a more ambitious uh, endeavor but I guess we have some few some years ahead of us to understand exactly uh, how to solve those problems right absolutely and I think I see um, you know to your point you know Mars really feels like a reach. However, I mean, we're, we're, we're making the strides. Like I said, we, we're understanding different aspects of it. You know, the human research program has what they're setting out for like MIA, a Mars exploration analog to start to sort out team dynamics in an isolated environment. And, you know, we're, I, th I see the, the lunar surface, sustainable presence there as sort of a stepping stone. Yeah. We can get out in that vicinity because you can return, right? Even though it's not yes. like a space station where you can get home in hours, you can still return to Earth, you know, yeah. in a shorter period of time. So there's so much we could learn from the lunar environment, how to establish a presence, how to take care of some of these, you know, challenges for the human health and survival before we go. So again, like the no before we go is just gonna be really critical for ensuring that we get out there, do do the mission and then return our crew home safely. Lisa, it was a pleasure, very clear, uh, love the conversation. So I hope we have the chance to talk, uh, I don't know, in the near future to exactly talk about this. How, how are we moving forward to understand yeah. what we need to get to Mars finally? Absolutely. So anytime, would love to chat with you more. So just let me know. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.